the Jewish scholar and professor Amy Jill Levine does this remarkable job of helping Christians to look with new and often more open eyes at the Jewish context of the New Testament scriptures, often challenging a lot of our presumptions, a lot of the ways the scriptures have been typically um, interpreted and explained, and especially um, setting our, a tendency within the Christian church to set um, Jesus against the, the Jews and his Jewishness. She helps us place Jesus in his very Jewish context, for he was a Jew after all. And if one's eyes are open, it's obvious that Jesus lived and taught in a Jewish landscape from a Jewish perspective. So our two scriptures this morning are evidence of that. Jesus' parable comes directly out of the prophet Ezekiel's writings, showing God as a loving shepherd. It's not as if Jesus was saying something radical that his predecessors hadn't, nor that, Jew, that the Jews presented God as wrathful and vindictive, and Jesus presented him as loving. That's sort of an unfair, binary way of kind of naming the Old Testament and the New. Not accurate at all. The two scriptures from this morning are evidence of that. The Jews were constantly talking about God as the loving shepherd. The Psalm 23, which is how we'll end our service today, is uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is the perfect example of that. So Professor Levine does, does a remarkable job of placing Jesus in context as a rabbi, doing what rabbis did for his time and, and place. And one of the ways that rabbis taught at the time was with the use of these little stories called parables. Small stories often with a multitude of meaning, always actually with a multitude of meanings, meant to force the listener to pay attention to, to the hidden aspects of our values, our assumptions, and of our lives. Dr. Levine says, parables are designed to challenge the listener and make them uncomfortable. So much so, she says, that if we hear one of Jesus' parables and think, I really like that, then we're likely not listening close enough. We miss the power of the parables if we jump too quickly to allegorized or, or moralized explanations. It means be nice like the Good Samaritan, or be smart with your money like the faithful steward or forgive like the prodigal son's father, or don't be like a resentful brother. But in fact, parables are designed to have many angles. While each of those could be true, there's much more contained in it. And as they're designed to shake us up, leave us unsettled, maybe even indict us. This, she explains, is how the genre of parables has always operated throughout Israel's history. So, a good starting point when hearing Jesus' parables, as we'll do this, the, our, our lectionary, the way they lay out the scriptures throughout uh, the church year, over the course of three years, that's what we call our, our lectionary, um, this particular fall, a lot of Jesus' parables come, come to us. So, a good starting point is not to say so much what does it mean, but how does this strike me? Where does this little story unsettle me? A good example of this is how unsettling it is to many of us at the end of the prodigal son story when the older brother stands in the field resenting his father for celebrating his, son, his brother's return. It's about the forgiving father. And it's about the repentant son. But if it's the older brother that makes, you un, makes us uncomfortable, within whom we can see some of our own shadow, then that there is where the parable's powder keg lies. 
So it's right there in the Gospel of Luke, just before the prodigal son parable, that Jesus tells these other two stories that Michelle just read for us. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Jesus tells these parables in response to the Pharisees, who were some of the religious leaders, and the scribes, some of the religious leaders, and they were expressing discomfort with Jesus eating and cavorting with sinners and tax collectors. All right, we hear this throughout the gospel. Jesus cavorting with sinners and tax collectors, the Pharisees and scribes, the Jewish leaders, uncomfortable with that. So our temptation is to judge those hard-hearted, legalistic, Pharisaic Jews when we interpret our Christian scriptures. But, as Professor Levine explains, we really have to realize that the Pharisees were highly respected. Good, merciful, God-loving, God-fearing people who most of us would really like. They're troubled by who Jesus hangs out with, and we would be too. The catchphrase, sinners and tax collectors, would be the equivalent, maybe just to throw out some possibilities, in our own day to drug dealers, arms dealers, inside traders, overt racists, sexual predators, people that we would feel were really not very good people. This doesn't mean, obviously, that Jesus condoned their behaviors, but he apparently didn't avoid, dismiss, or reject them either. Jesus always seems to be up for a good time, whoever it was with. Remember, at one point, he is labeled by decent folk, as a glutton and a drunkard. Hmm. So it's to the grumbling likes of us that Jesus tells his parable. He says, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one would not leave the other 99 and run off into the wilderness to find it? The answer that everyone around him would have given is, None of us would do that, Jesus. None of us would leave 99 sheep untended to find one sheep who is irresponsible enough in the first place to get separated from the flock. But Jesus continues, and upon finding this sheep, um, and upon finding them, wouldn't you throw him over your shoulder to bring him back home? throwing a full-grown sheep over your shoulder and carrying him on your own back? No. If anything, I might smack his rump or yell at him so that he knows how unhappy I am with having to go out of my way, putting everyone else at risk for his trouble. And once you got back, Jesus continues, wouldn't you invite all your friends and throw a party for, for that one sheep that you had carried out of the wilderness back home? No, most decidedly not. Everyone around Jesus would have said, no, are you crazy? There are 99 others. This would have been an annoyance, not a delight. But Jesus offers another parable, despite the discomfort and confusion of the crowd. Or if you lost one silver coin among your ten, wouldn't you sweep your house until you found it? That's a significant amount of money, one of these silver coins. Okay, yes, now we're with you, Jesus. And then gather all of your friends and throw a lavish party to celebrate its discovery. What? Spend as much money on the party as the silver coin was worth? No. So, it, those are the parables. And it should be a bit baffling, even with Luke's interpretation of it. It should be a bit baffling. No single meaning. And we should ask in reading it, what's the torque here? What's the edge? How does it disturb my own assumptions and trouble my convictions and chasten me to more faithful living? And, and obviously, one of the 
one of the meanings is that God is presented as the loving shepherd, as the Jewish people had presented across the centuries. God, uh, Jesus is reminding the Pharisees and scribes of that. A loving shepherd that seeks out the lost, those on the margins and the edge. And that is a beautiful and critical interpretation. But where's the hook and the edge for you that leaves you unsettled? Maybe that's it. But it's that hook is where the power of the parable lies. So I don't know how they work on you this morning. I would invite you to, to live with them maybe over the course of, of your week, these two little stories. Um, but I've had some time this previous week to live with them and allow them to work on me personally. And I'll share with you two ways beyond the, the obvious that these parables gnawed at me. Two entry points into my own life, two barbs that, that hook me and lead me like the Pharisees and the scribes to grumble at Jesus for being all Jesus-y. So first of all, I get irritable when I lose things. When something is lost, one of my first thoughts, and I can't have this excuse anymore because we're empty nesters, but but one of my first thoughts was when our house was full of children was, what did someone do with it? I'm sure it was right here on this table. In fact, because Tracy, my, my wife, does the majority of cleaning in the house, the girls and I often find ourselves convinced that she is the culprit for those lost things. Rarely is that actually true, but we don't learn very fast, and it sure is nice to have someone to blame. To be fair, she does have this incredible knack for finding the things we've lost, though it wasn't her fault at all, which then only reinforces our grumbling to her. Tracy! But then if it's not to her, I'll turn it to myself and get all grumbly about the inconvenience of it all and how I don't have time to be looking for my keys or my phone and how, how distracted can I be? What an idiot. Am I having memory issues? What the heck, Will? Ugh. And when I find whatever I lost, my mood does change. I do feel somewhat better, but also embarrassed that I was so irritable and they were in my pocket the whole time. And no, I'm not much interested in throwing a party, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm aware that the warp and weft of my daily life, in, in the warp and weft of my daily life, that, the, that too much of what I experience, I'm afraid, comes as an obstacle to how I've decided my day should be going and what I need to be getting done and how things are supposed to be going. Such small or not so small expectations can rule my life and ruin moments of it. You know, it's something of John Lennon's quote or John Lennon quoted it in one of his songs, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Or life is what happens to you while you're looking for your iPhone. To have the presence of mind to see whatever distraction or obstacle or challenge not as oppressing me and my plans, but as a part of life's living that is to be met with faithful attentiveness even, even when looking for lost things. Joy can enter in when full attention has been given to what life brings us, regardless of our expectations. Something less than joy, maybe even resentment, follows from the belief that this shouldn't have happened, or that it was a distraction from what I really needed to do, or is not a part of my plan. In other words, I myself can get too easily lost and need to allow myself to be found. So secondly, if Jesus reveals to us that God is a gracious shepherd king who pursues us in our waywardness, 
how must I take particular note of who is lost among and around me and place my attention on the least of these, to maybe the most irritating of these, to even those who make me unhappy or uncomfortable? Who are those in our circles who we might not even notice are missing on some level? And how do we tend to even the most or especially the most marginal of those people in our families, in our church communities, in our towns? Not, again, as though they are sidetrack or a distraction, but actually as the heart of where our attention should be. If this is the Good Shepherd God's movement in the world, seeking out the lost, then to be faithful to God, to allow God's presence to flow in and through us, we too must tend to the margins, to those on the outs, to those we don't have time for, to those lost, to those we might not even realize are lost. So I imagine the invitation is there somewhere in your life right now, in my life. If this parable is true, and if God seeks out the lost among us, and God is at work in our world, then in your life right now, God is wanting to seek out the lost through you. So where is she? What about him? It's easier to be without this person, but then we are not complete. That person makes us uncomfortable, which is exactly why they need to be here. And so on and so forth. So we offer, at the end of each of our sermons, a quiet time, what we call a quiet time of reflection after we preach. And, and this is an invitation to take something you've heard in the Scripture or in the words that Judy and I have preached and just mull it over for a moment before racing on to the next element of worship, just allowing God a little time to work on us. At least that's the idea. So in this quiet time of reflection, I would just invite you to consider who or what might be lost in your life and needs your attention. Ask God to reveal it to you.